it's, uh, it's with uh, great pleasure that I'm uh, able to welcome uh, Jenny Sabin to Waterloo uh, as our lecturer this evening. Jenny is a principal of Jenny Sabin Studio, which is an experimental architectural design studio based in Philadelphia. And she's also director of Sabin Design Lab at Cornell, which is a hybrid research and design unit with specialization in computational design, data visualization, and digital fabrication. She's an assistant professor in the area of design and emerging technologies and architecture at Cornell University. Jenny's uh, research and design practice focuses on investigating the intersections between architecture, biology, mathematics, computation, physics, engineering, and material science in the development of experimental structures, which she's going to uh, show you this evening. She's currently working on two projects for which she's a lead investigator, and she received uh, National Science Foundation grants uh, in the order of $2 million. Uh, we're not talking small grants. Working with a large collaborative team that are focused on responsive materials and building skins, programmable matter, and adaptive architecture. Previous uh, to her work at Cornell, Jenny co-founded with Peter Lloyd-Jones the Hybrid Research and Design Unit, uh, Sabin and Jones Lab Studio, where she was the first non-scientist member of the Institute for Medicine and Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania, and was also a founding member of Nonlinear Systems Organization, a research group at Penn Design that was uh, started by Cecil Bauman. Uh, Jenny has received numerous awards uh, and honors, including most recently the 2014 New York City uh, Architectural League Prize for Young Architects. She's exhibited her work uh, across the globe, uh, including projects like Polymorph, which was uh, sent out in the invite that was exhibited as part of the Naturalizing Architecture exhibition at the FRAC in Orleans, France. Uh, the, the Nike Stadium in New York, and she also exhibited at the Ars Electronic uh, in Linz, Austria. Jenny was also awarded uh, a Pew Fellowship in the Arts in 2010 and was named a U.S. Knight Fellow in Architecture, one of 50 uh, artists and designers that are awarded nationally in the United States. Her work has been published extensively in a number of journals, and she's also the co-author of a book called Meander, Variegating Architecture with Ferda Kolatan. Uh, Jenny and the nature of her uh, collaborations across many different disciplines, I think, is a fantastic uh, model for architecture, especially her collaborations with biology, uh, engineering, material science, and represents a uh, a kind of alternative future, I think, for architectural practice. And I think it's a fantastic model, um, and I hope you're as excited to have her here uh, as I am. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jenny Sabin. All right. Uh, thank you, Isla. Thank you also to Philip uh, for the generous invitation to join you guys tonight, um, as well as in the context of a workshop with Philip and his students uh, today and tomorrow. So tonight I'm, I'm going to address the subject of my talk, uh, which I've titled Elasticity and Networks, uh, Computing Biomatters, uh, through the lens of my transdisciplinary collaborations, uh, with a primary interest in developing an alternative material practice in architecture uh, through the generative fabrication of the nonlinearities of material and form across disciplines. And I'm, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the foundation um, of this work. And I'll just apologize now to those in Philip's studio if just a few points of this are redundant. But I think you'll continue to find it interesting. And then I'm going to talk about um, several applied projects uh, stemming from the core research um, as well as uh, applied projects in my, in my studio. Now, biology presents useful conceptual models for us as architects to consider, uh, where form is in constant adaptation with environmental events. It's here that geometry and matter operate together as an active elastic ground, a datascape that steers and specifies form, function, and structure in context. Now, through direct references to the flexibility and the sensitivity 
of the human body, I'm interested in developing adaptive materials and architecture where code, pattern, environmental cues, geometry, and matter operate together as a conceptual design space. And these are some of the, the data, uh, as well as tools that we've developed over, over the years. And I'll come back to some of those in a moment. Now, as, as Isla mentioned, uh, a lot of this work started while I was still uh, at Penn. I taught at uh, the Graduate School of Design and Architecture at Penn for six years before moving to Cornell. I just started my fourth year at Cornell, which is kind of amazing that how time has flown by. And it was there that I was a part of the, the nonlinear systems organization, um, along with Cecil Balmond. I taught with Cecil for four years, and this was all under the chairmanship of, of Detlef Mertens. And it was a really exciting time, uh, and I don't think we quite knew how special uh, it was in terms of the discussions that were occurring across disciplines in the context of the NSO and, and eventually in the context of the Sabin and Jones Lab Studio, uh, which I started with, with Peter Lloyd-Jones in 2005-2006. Uh, this is a photograph of the first day of a course that we co-taught for four years titled Nonlinear Systems Biology and Design. Uh, where we paired graduate architecture students uh, with postdocs and fellows in the context of the lab setting. And as I mentioned to the students um, a couple of hours ago, uh, before we started the course and before we started Lab Studio and going after grants, etc., uh, we actually spent about a year just figuring out how to communicate. And, and that was not an easy task. Um, and in looking back, uh, which is now almost a decade ago, uh, that was an incredibly important investment of time uh, because we quickly learned that we had very different um, modes of, of communication. Although we had shared like terms, we had very different definitions for those terms. And at the time, I sort of had a self-critique and critique, um, a positive one, um, of, of my colleagues in that we were being a, perhaps a bit too opportunistic in the words that we were borrowing in the context of digital tools and uh, generative processes, emergence, complexity, um, uh, genetic um, code, et cetera, and that we might uh, perhaps learn some things uh, from our colleagues in the sciences uh, in the context of core collaboration. And so Peter joined me in my studio reviews. I joined in uh, in his weekly lab meetings, and we developed a framework for working. And so the course uh, became a testbed uh, for exploring trajectories that then became formalized. And in the beginning, there, we didn't have a set of uh, strict goals at hand. It was very much a process-based mode of inquiry with a shared belief that if we formatted um, a pedagogical sh space for sharing, that new questions by default would emerge and hopefully new applications on both sides of, of, the, of the fence. Now, I was also influenced very early on uh, by the International Smart Geometry Group. Um, they continue to uh, keep me on my toes in the context of technology and, and computational design thinking. Uh, this was a very early workshop uh, in Cambridge in the UK, uh, where our muse for the first few years was the development of the first piece of parametric software, which was Generative Components, uh, put out by Bentley uh, and authored by Robert Aish. And we became a sort of test bed uh, and actually helped to design it in a way. Um, every, every night during the workshop, uh, Robert would announce that there was a new build and we would work on it in the context of our, our own applied projects. There are now um, annual workshops. I encourage all of you guys to get involved if you're interested. Um, but this became and still is a very important network of practitioners, uh, engineers, uh, researchers, academics, et cetera, uh, that I engage in in, in a collaborative way, but also um, rely on them to keep me up to speed uh, in their critique of, of what's going on in computational design. Now, in addition to these important foundational underpinnings, I have also been influenced, influenced by linkages between textiles and computation, as they give rise to the possibility of generative fabrication. Now, the technological and cultural history of weaving offers architecture a potent and useful relationship between design and digital fabrication. Uh, we could say that the mechanization of textile processes, specifically weaving, especially uh, weaving and knitting, 
are the first examples of, of 3D printing and certainly influence digital space. Now the coupling together of architecture and textile is certainly, a not, uh, is certainly not a new idea. Um, modern and historical examples that come to mind include the seminal and vast bodies of artistic and design work by Annie Albers, Gunther Stoltz, and Lily Reich. And importantly, the Bauhaus weavers marked a shift from expressionistic and individual handcraft compositions to mass-produced and rapid manufactured prototypes for furniture, interior design, and architectural elements. This shift led the way to a new approach to craft and making one that was marked by the integration of pattern, material constraints, form, and fabrication, perhaps offering up the first analog examples of generative and parametric design work in the context of scaled prototypes and fabrication. Now I'll come back to this influence of weaving momentarily as it relates to the extracellular matrix as a dynamic architectural textile, uh, if you will. So as with the MyThread Pavilion uh, featured here, which I'll come back to uh, in a moment, and Foyer Tapestry, which was an early project produced in 2006, uh, my work diversifies into linkages between computation and the binary natures of weaving and knitting that influence parallel innovations, including digital space and the contemporary computer. Uh, this is a, a binary draft notation for Foyer Tapestry, uh, which is based on the Foyer series, uh, which is a binary mathematical sequence uh, for the analysis of sound. And it's woven in wool and synthetic threads uh, using an early computational model for computers, uh, the Jacquard loom. And this is a, an image of a digitized Jacquard at Philadelphia University, um, whom I've been fortunate to collaborate with for a number of, of years now. And these are some uh, images of the installation of Foyer Tapestry. It was a part of the Hedge exhibition, uh, which I also was a co-designer on with Cecil and the Advanced Geometry Unit uh, in 2006 at Artist Space in New York City. Now overall, these, these early weaving um, prototypes uh, and applications formed a foundation for, for thinking and working, as well as integrating with alternative modes of digital fabrication. <laughs> And the process seeks to understand and intuit spatial patterns with data sets, uh, patterns that through study and analysis lead to architectural elements in the form of textile tectonics. Now we spent about an hour and a half talking about the ECM uh, earlier with Philip and, and his group, but I'd like to address it uh, again uh, for all of you because it's been an incredible um, potent set of ecological models uh, to, for myself and, and my researchers to consider. Now, early on, Peter Lloyd-Jones, who's a matrix biologist, uh, introduced me to the ECM. And basically, the big idea uh, with the ECM is that half the secret to life resides outside of the cell, right? And for years and years and years, up until the early 80s, the dogma, the going dogma, was that everything was driven by DNA or code. And so here, the extracellular matrix is a dynamic protein network a repository of biochemical and biophysical information, uh, a master regulator of function, sort of trumps that in the sense that here context specifies form, function, and structure. Now this matrix environment is a cell-derived, woven, and globular protein network that contacts most cells within the body. As I mentioned, it's, one could think of it as an architectural textile of sorts. It's also a biological model for what Annie Albers called the pliable plane, right? And importantly, as I've come to learn from my collaboration with, with Peter Lloyd-Jones and many others since then, this environment changes dynamically throughout development and disease. And we're specifically interested in models that show how these alterations feed back to control cell and tissue behavior at the level of code and beyond at multiple dimensions also including time. Now another collaborator who I met uh, early on in this work is Dr. Xu Yang, who I continue to collaborate with. Uh, we now are collaborators on two NSF grants, uh, which I'll be talking about tonight. And Xu and I uh, shared a thesis student early on at Penn. And she's engaged in biomimicry and the true definition of the word. Uh, and, and how she observes uh, the wings of butterflies or lotus leaves to synthesize, engineer, and fabricate 
and produce uh, new materials. So one of the concepts uh, that we've been working with uh, for a number of years now that she introduced me to is the notion of structural color, right? So in the case of the butterfly wing, at a micron scale, um, we don't see color, right? It's entirely based on wavelength and optics and changes in geometry and pattern relative to, to light. So it's not pigment based. Uh, she's also, also interested in the production of superhydrophobic and su superhydrophilic materials, again looking at lotus leaves as a primary natural model and point of departure. So water repellent or water absorptive uh, materials. And these ideas in the context of nano to micro scale material features and effects are something that we've been grappling with in the context of passively responsive uh, building skins and their potential application in architecture. Now, over the years, uh, this has since become more formalized, um, both in the core research as well as in my studio uh, practice. And as I mentioned early on, uh, we didn't necessarily um, have these phases delineated uh, from the beginning. Um, but this, these phases uh, allow us to, to grapple with the problem of scale in a, in a meaningful and rigorous way. So all of the projects start out with the production of, of a tool palette, um, new methods for modeling behavior that might start out with a particular data set, uh, a natural model, biological model, or perhaps um, a more abstract beginning uh, looking at an algorithmic process based on mathematics. Those tools are then brought into the realm of architectural prototyping, so productively contaminating the process with the, with the stuff of, of making and, and architecture moving into human scale applications, so bringing in material constraints, fabrication constraints, etc. And then finally, some of those uh, successful prototypes are brought into the third and most mature phase, uh, which was, is starting to think about built environments and building ecology at the scale of, of buildings. Now, I, I talked about this project at length uh, in, the, in the studio. I'm just going to mention it very, very briefly. Um, in that it was an important project for setting up a way of thinking, uh, a set of methodologies, and, uh, and a way of making. And that is branching morphogenesis, which was a part of the design and computation gallery, galleries at Seagraph in 2008. So in this project, uh, we developed advanced imaging and scripting procedures uh, to model networking behavior of cells, uh, to develop a pseudocode uh, to extract key principles and features of networking uh, human cells, endothelial cells, in their dynamic extracellular matrix environment, to then synthesize and extract and abstract a set of rules uh, that you see here, which investigate part to whole relationships uh, revealed during the generation of branched structures formed in real time by interacting lung endothelial, endothelial cells. Now the study and quantification of this network uh, allows for a greater understanding of how variable components might give rise to structured networks in both biology and architectural inquiry. And so after a series of digital investigations, uh, which started with a, a raw data set produced in the Jones lab of network, networking endothelial cells in their dynamic ECM environment, we settled on five slices in time, uh, the densest area of the field in this timescape delineated uh, with with the light gray and then red and dark gray. And so what started out as a very uh, digital investigation then moved into a very slow analog um, mode of, of making an, an inquiry. And so we worked one to one. These were some of the templates. Uh, there wasn't a budget for the project so we worked with zip ties, um, 75,000 zip ties. And overall the installation materializes uh, five slices in time that capture the predicted force network exerted by interacting cells uh, upon their neighboring matrix environment. Now one of the most important moments for me in this project, um, actually there were two. One had to do with uh, the, the material system that we elected to work with, uh, which was a ready-made, a cable zip tie, and the fact that that actually ended up playing a very important pedagogical role because it allowed for many different types of people from diverse backgrounds to engage the project because everybody knows what a zip tie is. So whether it was out of the sheer obsession of the environment or through the particular nature of the starting point, 
it allowed m many people to engage with it and, and perhaps dig a bit deeper in terms of, of the origins of the project. Uh, the other moment that was quite important for me happened about a third of the way through of its production when the director of the Institute for Medicine and Engineering at Penn at the time, Dr. Peter, Peter Davies, came over and was absolutely blown away by the fact that each zip tie represented a data point. And as I mentioned to the students uh, previously, it wasn't that each one of those components represented truth. I mean, the scientists don't know what truth is. I mean, this is the, they're about their core research. But it allowed for a new way of engaging the data, right, in a scaled uh, fashion, which provided multiple projections and hopefully, ultimately, uh, new ways of interrogating hypothesis-driven uh, and fundamental research and hopefully new questions that could be brought back to the bench side. And then just very briefly, we were very fortunate to win the um, first place in the 2009 Visualization Challenge and the project was featured on the cover of Science. And I will say, we had some tremendous supporters uh, from the beginning, uh, Detlef Merton, Cecil, Peter Davies, and, and others. Um, but there were a number of people that did not think what we were doing was uh, was necessarily uh, productive and, in fact, was not about science uh, or architecture or anything at all. And getting these kinds of stamps uh, was, was very important early on uh, in, the, in terms of forming a foundation for working. So I'm going to transition into one of our most mature projects uh, related to our core collaborative uh, research. Now that I've talked a little bit about the foundation, for the work and a way of thinking and a set of, of methods. And that's uh, eSkin, which was our first uh, successful NSF grant that we um, garnered in 2010. And just to give you a little bit of background, in 2010, the National Science Foundation put out a call for collaborative teams that would include architects. And it was the first time that they had ever done that. And the problem at hand, uh, was to deal with issues of energy in buildings and primarily the, the topic of sustainability in buildings. But they were interested in teams that would rethink the whole conceptual approach to the problem. And because we had about four years under our belt in the context of the Sabin and Jones Lab Studio, and I know this directly from talking to the program manager at the time, that was a, a key a component uh, to the success of securing one of the 10 $2 million grants. These are the, the key players on the team. Uh, Kiri Ahida Stansbury uh, is now uh, working on it as a cell biologist. Um, Xu Yang, material scientist, myself and my team with Andy. And Nader and Jan, who are electrical and systems engin engineers. Now, the, the conceptual foundation uh, for the project started, again, with the ECM and this notion of dynamic reciprocity between context and form. And what you see here is a single cell, um, a smooth muscle cell, which is a covering cell in the human body. Uh, it's nucleus stained in, in blue. And you can see its cytoskeleton lassoing up and around each one of these pillars, which is a PDMS or polymer-based substrate uh, produced in the material science scientist lab. And so we were interested in looking at this fine-scale uh, design ecology, uh, especially in observing how cells interacting with, with pre-designed geometric patterns alter these patterns to generate new surface effects. With the end goal, granted, keep in mind that the NSF uh, typically funds projects that are in their nascent stages, so they're interested in developing concepts, uh, but you do have to in your proposal have an end goal, which usually is you're 10 to 15 years away from that, uh, was, is to produce passively responsive building skins. Now, no, we're not suggesting that we put human cells on buildings. Uh, human cells work very well in our own bodies, but they don't necessarily work well on buildings. Um, but the cells are stand-ins for the development of uh, sensors and imagers that are locally dumb but learn and adapt over time. And that's where the expertise of Jan and Nader come in as the electrical and systems engineers 
uh, who also engage in biomimetic principles, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Now this is an example of uh, one of the predefined uh, geometric patterns, uh, which is embedded within a shape memory polymer material uh, that is displaying structural color change under deformation and recovery. And this is uh, the work of, of my colleague and collaborator, uh, Dr. Xu Yang. So you can see here at different scales, uh, this is at to, you know, the naked eye, um, so the effects and features that one sees and what's actually happening at a micron scale. So here's the original state, deformed state, and then the recovered state. So we're starting to engage parameters of not just structural color, uh, but color change and also transparency. Now some of the humps that we have to get over and some of the, the issues that are, are at hand, uh, again, have to do with, with scale. We're currently limited to basically a four inch maximum of the, of the e-skin substrate. So that, that therefore influences how large our uh, prototypical applications are. Um, and the initial prototypes, which we've been working on uh, for the last two years or so, have focused upon the optical properties of these materials. And although these qualities can be seen by the naked eye, extracting their optical performance quantitatively uh, for speculation at larger architectural scale applications is inc incredibly uh, necessary and important because of these constraints that we have with fabrication uh, currently. And I'll, I'll come back to that in, in just a moment. So our role as architects on, on the team um, involves generating tools to visualize and simulate cell attraction forces and cell behavior uh, based upon proximity to various constraints. Uh, you can see some of those tools and some of the parameters at the micron scale of the material substrates that we're working with, uh, such as pillar spacing, uh, the height of those pillars, uh, whether it's a grid or a gradient, compliance, etc. Um, we're also looking at forces distributed via a virtual extracellular matrix environment over multiple time states, uh, while also importantly incorporating material constraints uh, coming forward from SHU's group, uh, such as pillar spacing, as I mentioned, uh, for macro scale uh, study. Now, obviously, central to the project and our original proposal is the reduction of the overall carbon footprint in the built environment, uh, while also addressing important social and community-based topics that arise through large-scale transformations of building facades against environmental constraints. And I should just mention in that context that some of the work of Jan and Nader in, the, in terms of what they do with uh, biomimetic uh, principles, they look at things such as how insects see, um, particular insects, well, most insects see polarized light. Uh, we don't see polarized light. And they've effectively created sensors and imagers that can turn things invisible, right? So you can imagine what that might be like at the scale of a room and even the scale of, of a building. So not only do we seek to contribute uh, to sustainable green building, um, we, and that's the, everyone on the team, the engineers and the scientists, hope to inspire excitement uh, between disciplines and responsibility around the topic through beautiful spatio-temporal effects such as shape transformation, color change, transparency change, water harvesting, uh, et cetera. So we're not only interested in the functional properties of e-skin, but equally interested in the aesthetic and uh, potential applications that engage personalized architecture as contributing to the topic of sustainability and, and responsibility and engagement. Now, beyond visualization, uh, we also direct the architectural intent of the project uh, by constantly speculating as to how it results at the nano uh, and micro level will potentially look, feel, and assemble at the building scale. Uh, these are some of the recent uh, speculations that we've been producing, uh, which actually work with raw optical data simulated of the PDMS uh, substrates. So these are actual effects, uh, but shown rendered um, as interiors and, and facade systems. One of the things that we're looking at is the production of a tunable window. So in one of those, one of the initial e-skin uh, images that I showed you with the color change and the transparency, through a mechanical transformation, if you, if you stretch 
one of those four inch swaths, uh, you actually can tune that, the transparency of that, right? So what if we were to begin to look at that as a personal scenario within an interior set of conditions uh, where one could create their own windows, if you will? Uh, we're also looking at uh, local response, uh, so sensing-based color change, so the integration of, of humans uh, into this sort of fine-scale uh, nano to micro um, material production of features and effects. Uh, we're looking at a global response, uh, so passive color change through, through ambient incident light, and then also multi-directional incident light from uh, solar input. And this includes angle dependence, reflection, and uh, transmission. Now some of the, the current things that we've been looking at, uh, we've been looking at how context, uh, occupancy, and environmental factors become stimuli for change. So not working with buildings yet, but looking at hypothetical sites uh, and the environmental cues of those sites, uh, as well as changes in geometry uh, at a human and building scale and how those influence our simulations of the optical properties of the e-skin. And in the last uh, year plus, uh, we've been invited to showcase work in several exhibitions, uh, one of which was on V uh, Alive, curated by Carol Collet in Paris, and the other was Naturalizing Architecture, the Ninth Archilab at the FROC, uh, where we contributed uh, two new prototypes in both exhibitions. And the prototypes probe uh, the possible features and effects of e-skin at the scale of a building facade unit. Um, and in this case, we were looking at uh, developing a simulation. And what you see here, and we'll see a few more examples in a moment, um, again, are the actual optical properties of color change of the e-skin material as a simulation. But then we're also including a proximity sensor in this case uh, where the human component becomes, becomes a parameter, right? So one can adjust those optical properties, again, as a simulation and the tessellated geometries that we're including as a, as a kind of filter and therefore the registration uh, of, of your image. Now, importantly, this is not just detecting motion in the algorithms we've been developing. It's detecting difference, right? So it's looking at the difference between one event and the next and whether or not there's information gained or information lost. Right? So if nothing's changing, um, then that, that image will actually dissipate. Again, some of our, our recent uh, speculations, this at a sort of interior uh, scale in terms of thinking about screen systems, uh, looking at color changing effect and efficiency calculation. Uh, we've been publishing in CIMOD, which is Simulation and Architecture and Urban Design, for the last couple of years, uh, which is a conference I don't tend to normally publish in, uh, but the tools, methods, and prototypes that we've been producing as of late um, have been a, a good, good fit for that conference, which is just quite good. So here's a movie looking at that uh, simulation. Hopefully it'll play. There we go. So here, at its inception, uh, the color data appears generic. Uh, but is given specificity uh, per simulated viewing angle. And this is one person sort of moving back and forth here. The movement stops, so, and here he's, he's coming back. And so we've developed this uh, at basically as a, as a single component, a single unit, a box, and then we've also been recently in two other installations looked at it at the scale of, of a room and then also at the scale of a building facade. Uh, the most recent with Nuit Blanche at um, the Beaux-Arts Ball in New York City for the Architecture League, which was, was really a lot of fun. Now the second prototype, which we're, we're really excited about um, and was truly collaborative, everyone on the team worked side by side. I sent people from my lab at Cornell uh, down to my collaborators' labs uh, at Penn. And I should mention we, we meet monthly and then also uh, more intensely when we're working side by side. And the second prototype was on view at the FROC, um, is now part of their permanent collection, which is, which is super exciting. Hopefully it, will, it won't evolve. Um, it, but the prototype aims to advance speculative design trajectories uh, with, within, within the eSkin project 
as a, as a physical, interactive, and scaled component prototype whose properties behave in a comparable manner to those observed at a nano to micro scale, uh, but which can be fabricated at a human scale. So we're not working with the actual PDMS substrate that all of the optical data um, and uh, investigations in terms of, of moisture content, et cetera, but we're working with material that exhibits structural color change. Uh, specifically, what we're working with are what are called nanocolloidal particles. And get my arrow here. Um, and those nanocolloidal particles are sandwiched between two sheets of ITO glass, which is conductive. And you can see an array of, of sensors. Uh, and these sensors detect shifts in light intensity. So I, you, know, you can either pass by this whole thing or wave a finger in front of it. And then it sends, when it detects that change, it sends regional charges, um, so locally to these components, which in turn changes the packing density of the, those nanocolloidal particles, which then at the, hum, the human eye level uh, changes color and transparency. So effectively working with the same principles, uh, but with a different material, uh, which we find in nature. Uh, it's very opulescent. We can see in some seashells, also in milk, um, and, and many other products. So these were some early diagrams that we uh, pitched to the material scientists and the electrical engineers uh, as a way of, of working. Um, we, we had to work with fairly simple geometries uh, due to some of the fabrication constraints and also the cost um, that is, is significant. And this is just a view of the, the underbelly of, of the board, uh, which was all um, custom done by the electrical and systems engineers with, with our consultation. And then a view looking at some of those changes in real time. This took us a year and a half to make. <laughs> um, and outside of the sort of practical hurdles that we had to, to um, leap over, there were also hurdles in, in terms of engaging different modes of, of working. And in, in Shu's lab, they don't do applied research. They don't make things. They, they conduct fundamental research. I mean, they're constantly engaging creative uh, inquiry in the science that they conduct, uh, but they, their, their focus is not on the thing, right? Their focus is on, is on a continuum of, of re research and trajectory that is hypothesis driven. And so the differences between the kind of projective mode of design and the focus on the production of a thing uh, on the one hand formed a very productive mode of working, but on the other presented a series of, of pretty big hurdles to, to get over um, that were productive and, and positive in the end, but certainly were a bit new to the team uh, just through trying to make, make this, this uh, interactive prototype for the frock exhibition. And that's something that we, we continue to grapple with uh, as architects on a team of fundamental researchers and that we're interested in how this can impact archi architecture um, alongside how it can influence how they conduct research um, and you know, visualize and materialize uh, their, own, their own data. I'm briefly going to mention this because it is a project that we just finished uh, about a week and a half ago. But it serves as a bridge between um, the eSkin project and our focus on material substrates and their ability to passively respond uh, to dynamic scenarios uh, within, envir in, within their environment in terms of environmental cues. And a new NSF grant, uh, which we just got last year in collaboration with a physicist, Shu, and a, a bio and environmental engineer, uh, Dan Lau, who's also at Cornell, and in that project, we're looking at principles of kirigami. Now, kirigami is like origami, uh, but with the strategic placement of cuts and holes. Now, you might ask yourself, why would the NSF be interested in that? They're interested in that for a number of reasons. Um, thinking about nonlinear deployment of, of mechanisms uh, out in space uh, for uh, various applications, uh, the possibility of 
DNA-driven origami and kirigami uh, within the body as it relates to uh, biomedical applications, uh, and so on and so forth. And so for us, it's become an opportunity to look at larger scales of interactivity. So moving away from a singular substrate of the e-skin material uh, to arrays and aggregations of the e-skin material. And so just in the past year, we've been developing a series of tools, working with, with Randy Kamian, the physicist uh, whose expertise is in topology and, and modeling changes in, in geometry theoretically. Uh, so he, he models and creates uh, theories uh, around some of the features and effects that are produced in the materials um, uh, made by Shu and her group. So we've been developing a series of tools, uh, parametric tools. Uh, this is a very simple, simple model. Again, just starting extremely simple so that we can begin to engage more complex interaction. And this has transitioned into the development our, of our first prototype, which uh, we've called color folds, uh, which is a, an array of components uh, that fold and unfold in the presence or absence of people. Uh, there's also a degree of, of intelligence built into the boards uh, where they're communicating regionally with each other. So if one guy starts to unfold and fold, it, it knows that its neighbor is, needs to do the same. And on each one of the panels uh, of, of the colorful components, uh, we have a, a swath or a film that exhibits uh, changes in structural color based on, on wavelength. So here you can see some of the extreme variations that we're getting in optical, effect, optical effects based on our viewing angle, um, as well as changes in light throughout the day. I'm uh, co-advising a PhD student in mechanical engineering who's a part of, or was, he's now working for, for NASA, uh, was a part of Pod Lipson's Creative Machines group at Cornell, which is an amazing group. And so we've been collaborating with them a bit on some of the uh, mechatronics uh, and larger scale degrees of interactivity, um, which has been introduced into the lab and has allowed us to not look just at interaction, but what I'm primary, primarily interested in, in bringing this into this project, is how we can begin to amplify um, and tune some of the material effects uh, that we've been exploring for the past four years. And again, some of the differentiation that we're getting. Let's see underside, and just is constantly changing. This is this is on view in a recently renovated space um, in Cornell Architecture, third floor of Sibley, and we're treating this as an active experiment. We're going to be working with this prototype uh, throughout the semester. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna segue into two projects. I'm going to talk about two more projects and then we'll um, open it up for discussion. And these two projects have linkages to what goes on in my lab, um, but are have been produced in, in my studio. And I've purposefully separated the lab uh, and my studio on paper for many practical reasons. Uh, my lab is housed within, within Cornell. Saban Design Lab, um, where we, we work with the NSF funding. And then my studio enables me uh, to engage in applied projects and commissions uh, that are definitely influenced uh, by the trajectories of the research, but have different constraints at, at hand. Now, one of the, the areas of inquiry in that kind of middle zone of the different phases that we work within is, is generative fabrication or architectural prototyping. And as I mentioned, in a larger description of one project, which I'm not going to go into tonight, um, we were fortunate to gain a, to purchase a 3D printer with a grant early on in the research uh, at Penn. And at the time, it was the, the largest powder-based printer in terms of its build bed. And we were able to tinker with it. I, we still have this printer. It uh, now looks like an old dog, but it's still our, our favorite printer because you can actually open the hood and, and really push it around a bit. But I was interested in using the printer not as a representational device, but as a way of maximizing the build bed through rapid manufactured componentry. So generating much larger structures <laughs> through basic part to whole relationships. And this project, which related to 
a number of trajectories in the context of the biomedical uh, research um, was a starting point for that. And we were really just looking at the embedment of certain behaviors uh, towards the design and 3D printing of non-standard components and thinking about how those would come together. A little spin-off uh, that has come out of that work, which has now formulated a, a new core, well, it's actually not new now, this is in 2009, a core line of, of research is within the topic of digital ceramics. And so what you see here are some of our first successful 3D printed greenware parts. Uh, this is our, our trusty Z-Corp printer. I can now say that, that we put our own media in there because Z-Core no longer exists. Uh, but I have a BFA in ceramics and that knowledge has come back in a really useful way in the last five years in that we've been replacing the proprietary media with our own uh, clay body re recipes. And so this is a high fire uh, stoneware clay body mixed with a little bit of sugar and maltodextrin uh, to facilitate the printing process. And these are, you know, some of the constraints that we had to deal with. Just to show you the uh, kind of relationship between the same part, this is the basic media, and then this is a bisque-fired and glaze-fired uh, component. That has since been formalized into a series of uh, courses, uh, seminars in experiments and building construction techniques uh, within the, the umbrella of digital ceramics. Uh, the first installment was taught at Penn, and I've now taught it twice at Cornell, and we'll be teaching a third, a fourth time uh, in, the, in the spring, where students engage these ideas uh, towards the production of, of screen systems and architectural elements, uh, and they take it from generative design process uh, all the way to a, a full-scale uh, screen system uh, with the use of 3D printed uh, clay media. And we have uh, two production kilns uh, now at Cornell that sit alongside our, our laser cutters and, and CNC machines. So the project I wanted to, to show you uh, that is the most sort of mature project that I've developed in the studio project uh, within the line of uh, digital ceramics is, is Polymorph. And this was produced for naturalizing architecture at the Archie Lab, uh, which was on view last year and is now part of their permanent collection. So if you want to go see it, uh, it is there. I'm so glad I'll never have to take it down and you'll see why in a moment. And the generative process for this was very much influenced by all of the years that I've invested into observing how cells network and looking at networking topologies and how changes in environment, changes in force transmission, changes in compliance, uh, in turn alter uh, those networking behaviors uh, and, and componentry. And so we developed, that we didn't start the project with a data set. Um, we developed a series of uh, recursive tools uh, to look at networking behavior, uh, but through mathematics, based on all of the previous observations. So thinking about how one begins to spatialize a node how cells form surfaces, how they become compliant, how those surfaces uh, form tubes, how those tubes form organs and larger holes. Uh, we spent probably four months just trying to figure out what the component family uh, would be uh, and, and wanted that to be incredibly simple, right? That the inputs would be so simple, uh, but that the way that they aggregate and network uh, could be, you know, incredibly complex uh, in the number of, of iterations that were possible. So we settled on uh, three, three components uh, that had about 300 different ways of interweaving. And this diagram highlights those possibilities. And this shows the beginnings of a coherent material assembly, which basically has uh, two surfaces interweaving and then one of the, the kind of final speculations as to what this would be as a, as a polymorph, as, a, as an organized spatial uh, network. And we got an awesome site. We got a really, really cool site in the new building, which is done by Jacob and McFarlane in Orleans. Uh, the FRAC, if you don't know, has one of the most amazing 
and comprehensive collections of experimental architectural works, models, drawings, etc., from the 60s onwards. They have everything. They have everything from archigrams, you know, Super Studio. It's just incredible. And so with the new new building, they now have permanent space to exhibit their permanent collection, as well as uh, ongoing shows, which included Naturalizing Architecture, which was their opening show for the new building. And so you come through here, and our spatial installation is housed in one of the turbulences, which you'll get a view of in a moment. So in, in the context of this project, we didn't 3D print uh, the ceramic components. I wanted to use the, the printer to rationalize the complex curvature of the components to create two-part molds. And if you know anything about slip casting, uh, casting complex parts with just a two-part mold is, is pretty difficult. And so we were able to optimize that through a series of, of algorithms uh, to develop these positive mold halves. And so you can see one of the components basically embedded, uh, kind of cut in half, if you will, and then used those uh, to produce the negatives. Um, we made 20 plaster molds per part and did almost all of the production except for the glazing uh, in my studio in Philadelphia. I, I hired two ceramic sculptors uh, to lead the production because I wanted people on the team that really knew the material. And this is uh, Jillian, who's fabulous. And so again, what started out as a series of fairly sophisticated digital investigations uh, then became very slow and analog and in integrating uh, the human hand. And these were some of the first uh, fully um, glazed, complete parts and a view into um, the, the material system. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go by the next one really, really quickly, but it's gonna be a, a little bit of a hint for some of you in the, in the room. Um, <laughs> uh, there are over 1,400 uh, individually hand-cast uh, ceramic components. And this was how they were shipped uh, to the frock. I didn't sleep for a week and a half as they were being shipped. In fact, uh, one of the curators called me and said, Jenny, do you have a contingency plan if things break? And I said, no, there's no contingency plan. There, nothing can break. And miraculously, we, we didn't lose a single component. In fact, we only lost one the entire, during the entire installation phase, and it was because someone knocked one off the table on accident. Uh, we had a great team of local architecture students, French architecture students working with us. I think we took the award for the longest installation. Uh, we were installing for about three weeks. Um, and uh, we worked uh, from you know, component to component to part to part. And this gives you a view into, into the system. Now, working with slip casting was incredibly important in the context of the structure of this thing because running on the interior of this entire uh, sort of interwoven meshwork is a network of stainless steel cable uh, that's in continuous tension. So all of the components are in, in compression, uh, which if you know anything about clay, ceramics, they don't really like to be in compression, but in this case, um, it worked quite well in terms of how we were designing the spatial structure. Um, and so as we started to aggregate this thing, it slowly started to take shape. And so, again, keep in mind that there's hidden running through this whole system is a continuous uh, network of steel cable uh, in tension. And we would, we would locally tension parts, um, and then parts would be connected to parts uh, in situ. Uh, this is the turbulence, so it's, it's in there. And these are some of the views uh, as it started to take shape looking up into into the oculus, the skylight. So you start to see these kind of calcified, lacy, interwoven uh, conditions. And then some of the, the final uh, overall sort of formal expressions in terms of its morphology. Again, starting with a cell, a cell meeting a cell, a cell responding to its environment, um, understanding how that can create much larger morphologies, interiors, manifolds. 
etc. And this just gives you, gives you a glimpse of the kind of the shifts throughout the day, uh, just the light passing through. This one really broke the bank in terms of installation. It was incredibly meticulous. Uh, and as I said, I'm glad it's not coming down. <laughs> so it's, it's there permanently. They're, they're really excited about it. Um, and there, I should mention before I talk about the last project, um, we're now working on, and I can show you a few images if you're interested at the end when we're talking. We're now working on, we just published a paper in Hod Lipson's new journal called 3D Printing, uh, which is titled Polybrick and there's a subtitle, but uh, we're working on what we think is the first mortarless 3D printed brick wall. Uh, so moving back into the direct printing of, of componentry, uh, using age old traditions of, of wood joinery uh, and gravity to connect uh, all of the bricks. So that's, that's kind of where we're at with the next steps of, of this work. And so I'm gonna close with, with this project, uh, which was a commission from Nike in, in 2012. Uh, they invited uh, six people uh, from around the globe uh, to riff on a new technology that they had developed, which essentially is knitting shoes. And they were in genuinely interested in how we, which included architects, uh, one fashion designer, and then was primarily architects, um, and then some uh, just, I think there was one, one fashion designer and then the rest were architects, if I remember correctly. But they uh, commissioned a curator to select the six people and they were interested in how we might begin to work with the core benefits uh, of the Flynet uh, technology and scale those up and bring them back into our own field. Now out of the six, I was the, the only one that actually wanted to work with knitting and I think Nike and their team, was they were a bit surprised by that. Uh, but I was able to go visit their campus and meet with uh, directors of the Innovation Kitchen and see things that a lot of their employees don't even get to see and really sort of understand deeply how they're, they're making these, these shoes. And so I was interested in working with data sets stemming from the human body, so thinking about the com complexity of the human body in the context of bio data and forming a bridge uh, between that and the simplicity of, of knitting. So I think you're probably starting to see some, some themes here. And this was a, a video that they put together. Um, there were three workshops that led up to the final pavilion, which took place in New York City, and I designed the brief uh, for, for each workshop, uh, where we had about 30 participants from diverse disciplines coming from everything from fashion design to biology to uh, extreme sports uh, to street skaters. I have to say it was probably one of the toughest briefs that I've had to put together uh, given the diversity of the participants, but it, they were really pretty amazing workshops. And from those workshops, uh, we started to collect uh, data streams. I'll come back to that in a moment and developed a whole series of visualizations uh, in my studio where we began to link parameters um, inherent to knitting uh, with those data constructs uh, as a way of engaging shifts in tension, uh, shifts uh, in density, uh, shifts in uh, material performance, uh, and so on. And although I knew quite a lot about weaving, I didn't know anything about knitting, and so I very early on formed a collaboration with Anne Emling, who's a textile designer who's formerly at RISD and an expert on knitting. And we spent a very intense weekend together. I had a few interns from my team uh, working side by side with her. And the goal was really just to understand the, the key parameters uh, that we could work with, uh, looking at also degrees of, of transparency, uh, scale, uh, working back and forth between hand mechanical knitting machines uh, and uh, digitized knitting machines, and then that led into the first workshop. Um, actually, this is the second workshop that, that Anne also participated on, 
The first workshop was all about collecting data, so we outfitted the participants with uh, various sensing devices. They went out into Manhattan and were engaged in a series of activities. And then I worked closely with uh, the Nike Fuel Band group uh, um, back at the Nike campus uh, to work with that data. And I basically got these huge Excel file data dumps. Believe me, there's a lot more behind those little fuel bands than what your readout says, which was interesting. Um, and the second workshop we was all about making sense of the data. And so we had stations of expertise and had a station of expertise. Uh, we manned the, the digital visualization station. And so, so the participants created their own patterns uh, from those data streams and then were able to actually knit them and eventually integrate them with a series of, of 3D printed components. And so all of that uh, became sort of fodder and, and, and input uh, for the final pavilion design. And I was, I was also really interested in working with responsive materials and you know, materials that could accentuate and extend uh, the data con constructs that we were working with. And so I elected to work with photoluminescent, solar active, and reflective materials. So um, some of the materials would collect UV and then glow. Uh, the solar active changes immediately in the context of the presence of the sun. And then the reflective is an immediate burst of, of light. And then these were some of the, the components that were produced in the workshop. And we took all of that back uh, to the studio and started to refine uh, the pavilion design and how we were filtering that data in. I think you can probably see some similarities to branching morphogenesis, although a bit more sophisticated in the way that we're deploying it. Looking at digital nits, how the parameters start to create rhythms, deeper expressions, inherent structures that we couldn't necessarily see um, beforehand, and then finally deploying that into uh, an array of of knitted conoids. Now, I was a bit naive, maybe productively naive, in thinking that it would be easy to find a knit manufacturer in the States and the North Northeast when we were ready to go to production. And I won't bore you with how many closed doors I, I faced, but uh, I finally settled on working with Shima Siki, uh, an amazing company that also makes knitting machines. And they fortunately have a factory uh, in North Jersey, basically halfway between Philadelphia and New York City, so it, was, it couldn't have been more perfect. And they are at the forefront of what they call whole garment knitting. And what that is, is seamless three-dimensional three um, knits. And they work at the scale of the body and sort of haute couture uh, fashion design and had never thought about, you know, architecturalizing what they do. But the ability to work with, in 3D, with no seams was, just blew my mind, it was really cool. So for the first two weeks, I planted half of my team with Shimasiki, trying to figure out how we could interface their uh, knitting machines. And their knitting machines look like rockets. They're, imagine like a whole array of needles that move back and forth, back and forth. And in the end, you get the seamless, uh, one could say 3D printed, one could say knitting is the first example of 3D printing um, form at the end. So these were some of our first successful uh, tests. Some of the you know, optimization and parameters that we were working with, uh, you know, moving from very crude renditions of the conoid topology uh, into smooth meshes. And then we settled on, again, a component family it was quite large to start with, and Shima just looked at me cross-eyed like, you have to be absolutely nuts if you want to do that many uh, different cones. And so we simplified it. And some of them were as short as one foot. We actually had very shallow cones that we called windows, and then some were upwards uh, 60 feet. And this is a drawing highlighting the, the data streams or the sort of the DNA that we were, we were working with. And we worked with holes, ladders, and shifts in density as the knitting parameters that we attached uh, to those data. And the entire knitted uh, structure is held in tension uh, within 
um, a series of panels of laser cut aluminum rings uh, also held in tension. These are some of the early simulations. And then some final views of the final installation, just giving you some insight as to how it was housed. Uh, this is Nike Stadium in the Lower East Side. It was originally supposed to be outside, and I'm glad that it wasn't because if you remember the fall of 2012, we had some pretty intense weather, um, as, as well as the delicacy of, of the fabric. Um, so we, we actually elected to not have a, a steel frame. Um, we used the site as, as the frame that the aluminum ring networks were tensioned between. And just some quick um, drawings to give you some context of the space. And so once we had all of those individual uh, conoid knitted elements, uh, there were, I think, around 350 of them, um, give or take. We then had to figure out how to, to sew all of those together to form the final fabric structure. And so I worked with Daisy and Fabrics. They produced, I think, the largest template drawing I've ever seen. A huge, huge drawing, and they, they lit literally worked one-to-one -one with this. And this is what it looked like before it was pulled into tension. <laughs> this kind of strange, bizarre, cocoon-like thing. And just because you, you guys will appreciate this, someone decided to use black Sharpie to, to label the insides of the, each of the cells or the cones. And they, they, they didn't understand that there was an interior and an exterior. <laughs> So I think we, we bought out all of the medical tape in, in Lower Manhattan in a single week. Uh, one of the best parts about this project is that it weighs about 150 pounds and fits in a single canvas bag. And here we are installing it. This gives you a sense of how it works. So each cone has its home. Uh, there's two rings. So the ring, it goes through the first ring. Uh, we work with felt washers and just mechanical screws. And then the second ring comes on the outside to hide you know, any of the, the fray. And this was a pretty magical moment when even with all the testing, you know, analog stretch tests, simulations, uh, it actually worked and worked better than I anticipated. So once everything was pulled into tension, it formed this elliptical taut tension ring running around the whole thing. And this is the area that you get to inhabit. This is a kind of interstitial zone in this kind of interesting play with a harder exterior skeletal type network uh, with a very soft organic body on the inside. And then there were two door doors. Um, people could hop, you know, go underneath and pop up on the interior. And then these cones were allowed to project outwards and meet the opposite wall. This was at the opening night. It, it houses about 30 people comfortably. And I, I worked with a lighting designer, uh, Benji Kane, to simulate a day-to-night sequence uh, to activate the responsive uh, thread networks and, and get a sense of some of the intense differentiation. Here we, we get the, the solar active threads activated. These are mostly the photoluminescent. And so over the course of an hour, it would move from like early morning light all the way to an evening cycle. and then. And then we would just turn everything off, and the whole thing would slowly start to fade. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty, pretty great. Um, and then we were invited back by Nike this time a, a team in Berlin for the Nike Flynet experience, and we did a much larger structure. This was about six, no, not six. It's about a hundred feet, I, if I remember correctly. Um, where there were two inns that you could inhabit. Um, this was an early, an early drawing. And we produced this in, in two months. So we were able to take all of the R&D that we had developed for the first one and, and redeploy it um, in a new structure. And I'm continuing to work with them and excited to see where this evolves in terms of the, you know, thinking about fabric architectures and, and textiles as a possibility for for architectural applications. 
And I have to say, Nike has been amazing to work with. It was the first time I've ever engaged working with a major corporation, and they, they've just been amazing. And that I would never be able to do projects like this without their, their resources. So with that, I think I will conclude. Um, but with just some parting words, uh, if you're interested in seeing, there's lot, there, there's more work if you want to look at the lab or, or the studio. Um, and I'll just end uh, with, with this. So while the exploration of biological and nano to micro scale material properties and effects at the human scale form the starting points for many of the featured projects, the disciplinary hurdles that we encounter through the production of projects across scales culminate in what is perhaps, and I really believe this, the most potent deliverable, at least for now, which is a new model for transdisciplinary collaboration. The scalar constraints that we encounter span material science, cell biology, textile engineering, fashion sport, electrical and systems engineering, and architecture, which in turn challenge the differences between fundamental and applied research. Through the collaborative production of these applications, we encounter key differences between the conceptualization and materialization of the projects whose success demand that science, engineering, and design, and art meet. The creative navigation of this ambiguous line between science and arch architecture in turn offers up a unique model for collaboration across disciplines that defines, I think, a positive new future for the architect and architecture. And the role of the architect, where authorship is horizontal, giving way to interiorities, elastic networks, fabrics, and topological meanders that are pliable, plastic, ecological, and open, where geometry and matter are steered and specified by the flexibility and the sensitivity of the human body, and perhaps the most important deliverable to date is this new model for collaboration across disciplines, where overlay act, acts as an active datascape, forming a bridge and a point of departure. Thanks.